Um, it's really a great honor to speak at this wonderful occasion, uh, honoring Nati's scientific achievements. So um, I first spoke, if I remember correctly, with Nati directly when he offered me a postdoc position by phone. So that was December 2005, if I remember correctly. I got a high fever right after that. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> And, and was, he, he, it, this is really true. I was in bed for a few days to recover. Yeah, so he has that big influence on me. So that was 11 years ago. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> so once I came here at the Institute, my office in the IS was in front of Nati's office. And Nati's office door was often open. This was, in fact, very convenient. And many people might be wondering, Convenient? Is that the word to describe that? I mean, uh, originally I thought this was a bit scary, but it turned out to be very convenient. For example, one cold winter day, I overheard Davide Gaiotto chatting with Nati. Somehow they sounded very excited, and I was in the <laughs> office on, I mean, right in front of Nati, so I asked them if I could join. Um, it turned out that Davide was explaining to Nati what became known as the class S theory. It was, in fact, a few months before the first paper came out, so that gave me a head start working in this business. <laughs> so, I mean, having an uh, office right in front of Nati's was very, very helpful. <laughs> I have another episode. Um, in 2008, I gave a local seminar here. On a counterexample to the A theorem, I thought I found with Al Shapir. Um, so, well, uh, we've heard about the A theorem uh, many times during this conference already, and I guess uh, people younger than me, I mean, there are people like that these days. <laughs> 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 people, people younger than me might think that the validity of the A theorem is something taken for granted, but that was not like that, I mean, six, hmm? So some years ago. And uh, when I finished my talk, Nati immediately told me that he didn't like that <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, I didn't hear about it f for two years, but some one day, two years later, he told me that he debugged it with Davide. And in the end, it became a paper by Nati, Davide, and me correcting what I thought to be the counterexample. So what was happening was that the IRL limit was not a single CFT. It was a composite of two almost decoupled CFTs. So I learned a lot from the experience. So, so, and the A theorem was proved by Zohar and Adam Shuvima soon after that. So as you can see from the <laughs> uh, episodes I just told you, um, I learned a lot uh, by working with him. Um, so far, I have the privilege uh, to, to have written three papers with Nati. Um, of course, I learned a lot about, I mean, physics in general uh, through those experiences, but somehow I feel I learned more about the right attitude toward physics. So, for example, I mean, the importance of finding the right question to ask. I mean, sometimes the question is not right. In that case, it's no use, I mean, following that question or the importance of identifying the crucial elements in the answer. So sometimes you f might find that you already got the answer, but somehow you still don't identify what is really the key. And in that case, you really need to identify that. Also, um, so far nobody has mentioned, but uh, I mean, I think it's, I, I learned a lot from Nati how to express these uh, uh, crucial elements concisely in a paper. So in our collaboration, um, it often happened that when he edits the draft, the draft became at the same time shorter and clearer. That was, that was a singular experience, I think. I mean, in every other collaboration, whenever somebody edits a paper, it becomes longer, you know? <laughs> but, uh, here, here things are different. And the final outcome is much better than the original one. So, so you know, I remain such a loyal follower of Nati or a disciple, that when I heard the rumor last summer that he and Edward Witten were working on topological phases, I was in Japan, I need to work on it too. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so today, I'd like to say something about what I learned uh, during the last year. So, um, so this is a new topic for me. So I, I guess there are people more experienced about these subjects in the audience. So please correct me uh, when, when I said something wrong. So all what I'm going to tell you is based on my collaboration with Kazuya Yonekura, uh, who is a postdoc at IPMU right now, and he was also a postdoc here at the IAS. So today, I'd like to discuss uh, the anomaly of time reversal symmetry of two plus one dimensional systems. So I'd like to say something about these things, like what is it in the first place, and what are some systems that have it, and once you understand them, um, how, I'd like to answer how should, war, should we determine this anomaly, right? Um, so, I've been working on various forms of anomaly in the last, you know, 15 years or something of my research life. And um, so, I, I like this anomaly very much, but I've never studied this anomaly of discrete symmetry or finite group, that concept is very confusing to me, so it was a fun experience. So, um, I'd like to first remind ourselves of a completely understood case of the standard anomaly of a continuous symmetry U1 in three plus one dimensional systems. And once you view uh, this system in the right way, then everything nicely generalizes to a more, slightly more unfamiliar case of this time reversal symmetry of three-dimensional systems. So the questions are, what is it? What are some systems that have it? And then how should one determine it? So those are the questions. Um, so what is it? Uh, well, this has been answered. This was answered long time ago. So this is a phase ambiguity of the partition function of that system in the presence of background U1 gauge field. So you introduce background U1 gauge field, and if you change the gauge of the background gauge field, then the partition function does not remain uh, invariant, it changes. So, but, so I used the word ambiguity, but uh, in fact this phase ambiguity occurs in an extremely controlled way, so that's the important part. So, this is, so that ambiguity is controlled in this way. So consider a five-dimensional closed manifold first. So we would like to understand the four-dimensional systems, but we need to consider five-dimensional closed manifold, and uh, let's call it X, and let's say you have a U1 field on it. So I, this is not dynamical, this is a background U1 field. And let's consider the Chan simons action, which is an exponential time of two pi i k, where uh, integral over X of this A wedge F wedge F. Um, this combination is invariant under the gauge transformation, both small and large, if k is integer. Um, and I would be very sloppy about the normalizations, so please forgive me. But the important point is that this, is, this k needs to be quantized and takes a value in the integer. So this is so far very uh, trivial, but uh, what happens is that suppose this manifold x has a boundary m, right? Then this chern simons action is no longer gauge invariant. If you, uh, e even when uh, it is invariant on a closed manifold, so that k is integer. That is because if you take the gauge variation of this uh, term, then there's something localized at the boundary. So this is no longer uh, invariant under the change of the gauge. But you can restore the gauge invariance by adding something physical at the boundary of this five-dimensional manifold. So the boundary is four-dimensional. So that the combination of the partition function of this boundary system together with the bulk churn simons term is invariant. The phase ambiguity in the first part is completely canceled and completely characterized by the phase variation of this churn simons term, one-dimensional higher. So uh, this mechanism is uh, called the anomaly inflow, and I, it, it has a long history, so I'm just reviewing the materials, uh, which is very, very classic by now. So uh, what are these uh, something physical? So there are many cases, 
but the typical example is just charged chiral fermions, charged chiral 4D fermions on the boundary, right? So the typical system you'd like to consider is uh, the combination of a physical chi chiral fermion on the boundary together with the uh, five-dimensional bulk. Again, so, so everybody learns this in the QFT course, I mean, advanced QFT course, where you learn uh, the anomaly descent formalism and things like that. But uh, is there another way to see that such chiral fermions somehow more naturally arise on the boundary in a slightly more dynamical way? So that's the thing I'm going to discuss next. So again, forget for a moment about uh, four-dimensional physics, and let's consider five-dimensional physics. So let's consider a K-charged massive uh, 5D fermion with the mass term of this form. Then uh, if you integrate them out, that generates the Chan Simons term of this form. So if you integrate out K uh, fermions, then you get uh, Chan Simons term with coefficient K over two in some normalizations. And depending on the sign of the mass term, uh, that determines the sign of the exponent of this Chern Simons term. So this means that uh, instead of considering this Chern Simons term 2 pi i k uh, on the hemisphere, um, you can represent the same uh, gauge variation on this boundary as having plus 2 pi i k over 2 on one side and having minus 2 pi i k over 2 on the other side. I mean, this is, these two are basically equivalent. But now I just told you that these Chern Simons term can be thought of as the low energy limit of having a charged uh, fermions. So you can replace them as, so, so that on this part you can replace them as k 5D fermions with uh, positive mass term. And on the other side, you have K 5D fermions with negative mass. So that's what you have if you try to have these different Chern Simons terms on both sides of the uh, manifold. Then there's an important fact. So if you have a 5D fermion whose mass is space dependent, such that it is positive on one side and it is negative on the other side, uh, if you solve the fermion equation, Dirac equation, you find that there is a zero mode uh, supported at the boundary, right? So this means that um, we have uh, K, if you start from K 5D fermions with positive mass term and the K 5D fermions with negative mass terms on the other side, uh, you know that you automatically have k 4D massless chiral fermions as zero modes. So in this way, uh, you understand that the um, anomaly under the gauge variation of the U1 background gauge field here is carried by the Chan Simons term on the other side and Chan Simons on the other side. So, uh, so this is what I wanted to say, right? So you have k 4D massless fermions and uh, on the bulk, you have the Chern Simons term. If you change the gauge of the background gauge field, there's some phase ambiguity of this uh, massless chiral fermion. And at the same time, you have some uh, change in the phase of this term localized at the boundary, and they nicely cancel. So at this stage, this might be, this might look like something a, a bit uh, um, physical or some mathematical technique to control the phase uh, dependence of this boundary. Um, what I wanted to review in this section in the well understood case was that uh, uh, there is an equality of picture. So this one I just re uh, reminded you. And another picture where you have um, in some sense K massive fermions on one side and with positive mass and K massive fermions with negative mass on the other side so that you have the zero modes, right? And if you take the extreme low energy limit, I mean, having a massive fermions and having just a 
background transcendence terms are indistinguishable, so these pictures are basically the same. Okay, so that is my crude review of the situation of the uh, anomaly for the U1 uh, background field uh, in the three plus one dimensional systems. So that was the anomaly of U1 symmetry of three plus one dimensional systems. But uh, um, I wanted to discuss uh, today, uh, as I said in the title, the anomaly of the time reversal symmetry of two plus one dimensional systems. So um, when I started learning it uh, half a year ago, sorry, a year ago, I was very confused because I got used to analyzing anomalies using something called anomaly polynomials, which is always uh, given in terms of the uh, differential forms and characteristic classes, uh, written in terms of differential forms. But uh, I mean, there's no such thing for discrete symmetries like uh, time reversal. So how would we do that? So the point is that, to t the point to, for me was that it might be a bit difficult to understand the correct generalization of this part, but it's perfectly natural to understand it in terms of the second picture where you have uh, dynamical massive uh, fermions in the bulk. So in order to understand anomalies of three-dimensional systems, According to what I reviewed, uh, you need to consider some massive sy system in four dimensions, one dimension or higher. And the thing you consider is a very simple one. You start from a massive Majorana fermion with the mass term uh, um, m psi psi. And uh, in order for this system to be invariant under the time reversal, this mass term, I mean the coefficient m, needs to be uh, a real number because the time reversal transformation changes m to m bar. So, uh, so there are two distinct situations, right? Um, m needs to be non-zero, and therefore m positive and m negative are disconnected if you want to keep the system uh, in a massive phase. So, so now, again, I'm following exactly what I told you, uh, what I reminded you about uh, uh, U1 anomaly. So what you do is to make the mass space dependent. So on one side, the mass is positive. On the other side of the space time, the mass is negative. And the solution to the Dirac equation is basically the same, independent of the space time dimensions, because what matters is the dimension transverse to this um, uh, lower dimensional manifold. So you again find a single uh, fermion zero mode, which in this case, gives us a massless Majorana fermion in two plus one dimensions, right? So, I mean, this schematic picture is really exactly the same as the one I uh, reminded you in the case of uh, U1 anomaly in four dimensions. So, for, so in this case, we have new uh, 4D fermions with positive mass on one side, and new 4D fermions with negative mass on the other side, then automatically uh, it is guaranteed that you have new uh, massless Majorana fermions on this three-dimensional boundary. Uh, but uh, in order to really uh, capture things, um, you need to consider general non-orientable manifolds, both for the bulk and the boundary, to, because um, in the case of uh, U1, anomaly, what you needed to do to see phase ambiguity was to introduce background gauge field for the um, U1 symmetry, right? So in, in this case, you need to introduce something like background gauge field for time reversal. So what is it? Um, so I haven't told you yet, but I'm assuming relativistic invariance all, all the time. So having a time reversal it's basically equivalent to having a parity transformation because in a relativistic system, it is guaranteed that, uh, um, it is guaranteed that uh, CPT transformation is there. So what you need to do is to introduce background gauge field for the parity and, uh, or reflection symmetry. So you need to allow something like a local flip of the orientation if you want to gauge it. So you need to introduce uh, non-orientable manifolds. 
So you need to consider this situation with non-orientable systems, but uh, um, philosophically it's not very different from this, the previous case of U1 symmetry in one higher dimensions. Uh, in the case, in that higher dimensional case, there was an expression in terms of the Chan Simons term, right? Instead of using this dynamical fermions. So, what would be the corresponding expression in this uh, three dimensional case? So, uh, so, of course, if you take M, the absolute value of the mass term to be very, very large, you can integrate them out, and something very, very trivial remains. And that is usually denoted like this, exponential of 2 pi i nu times this eta, where this eta is called the so-called eta invariant. That plays the role of the chern simons term in this case. And uh, so, so far I've been talking in the way I thought to be more understandable to uh, people with a high energy physics background, but uh, condensed matter theorists also like this system very much, and they know the bulk, uh, bulk of this system under the name three plus one dimensional topological superconductor. I don't have the time to uh, explain why condensed matter theorists uh, call the bulk topological superconductor, but for my purpose, it's just uh, the bulk that needs to cancel the time reversal anomaly carried by these uh, massless Majorana fermions. So that's what it is. Uh, there is, however, a crucial difference between the U1 anomaly and the time reversal anomaly. So on a closed, uh, let, let's consider closed 4D manifold X and consider this exponential of 2 pi i, the eta invariant. So what would you do in the U1 symmetry case is to consider closed five-dimensional manifold with whatever U1 gauge field on top of it and consider the Chan Simons term. That, uh, in the one-dimensional higher case of U1 symmetry, that can take arbitrary value. Therefore, arbitrary integral power of that uh, made, made sense. Therefore, in the case of three plus one dimensional uh, U1 symmetry, the anomaly is a value measured by an integer, k, right? But here, uh, in the case of this eta invariant, it is known that this exponential, two pi i eta, for closed uh, manifold is a 16th root of unity. Therefore, um, you want to raise that uh, by some integer number nu, but that only nu mod 16 matters. So, therefore, the anomaly of the two plus one dimensional time reversal system is not really an integer, but it is an integer mod 16. This is known under the name of Z16 classification of the three plus one dimensional interacting topological superconductor to the condensed matter physicists. But uh, um, for my purposes today, this means that uh, not only the bulk, but the property of the time reversal anomaly of the two plus one dimensional systems is a quantity nu, which is a mod 16 integer. For example, if you consider new massless two plus one dimensional Majorana fermions, which is time reversal invariant, then that corresponds to the anomaly nu mod z16. So, uh, in, so originally, of course, you can count the number of fermions in, by integers, but as far as the anomalies are concerned, only the number of fermions mod 16 matters. So that's the, uh, that's the important fact uh, condensed matter physicist told us uh, a few years ago. So, so that was uh, the classification, but so far I only talked about free fermion systems. That might be a bit uh, too boring, although free fermion systems are very, very uh, subtle and uh, a lot can be learned from that. But let's think about something else. 
what are other two plus one dimensional systems, which is, first of all, time reversal invariant, and then time has some anomaly under the time reversal. So there, is a, there are various ways to construct such things, but let's do the following. Let's start from particular number of new of four-dimensional time reversal uh, invariant modular fermions. And on one side, you consider positive mass. On the other side, you consider uh, that this negative mass. So if you don't do anything, you get three uh, three-dimensional uh, modular fermions with time un reversal anomaly nu, uh, which is given by three, right? But now I want to do something. Regard these three fermions as transforming in under the adjoint representation of SU2, right? And you couple dynamical SU2 gauge field to it. Uh, you need to make sure that that coupling of the dynamical SU2 gauge field doesn't ruin various uh, anomaly properties of the bulk, but you can do that, you can show that. So please trust me about it. Um, <laughs> so if you assume that, uh, you can analyze this system using a uh, field theory language. So in the bulk, what you have is basically n equals one SU2 super young mills, right? I mean, if you couple uh, massless fermions in the adjoint of SU2 to dynamical SU2 gauge field, it is automatically supersymmetric. Here you are breaking that supersymmetry by hand by giving it a small uh, soft mass, which is m larger than zero on one side, and m larger than, sorry, m smaller than zero on the other side, right? So what do you have at the boundary? So because of, so basically I'm doing a kind of Tohoft anomaly matching, but in the case of time reversal anomaly, we started from three, and nu equals three, so whatever continuous deformation you do, you end up with nu equals three system. So essentially, um, suppose you don't have any mass deformation, then we know that n equals one SU2 super melts has two vacua, right? So, I mean, I guess everybody in the audience know what this <laughs> picture means, but in the space of the gauge you know, condenses, there are two points, uh, which is the vacuum. And if you give a soft mass, what happens is that on one side of the uh, manifold, uh, the vacuum is pinned to one. On the other side of the manifold, the vacuum is pinned to the other. Therefore, you have automatically a domain wall between the two, right? So the question is, what do you have on the domain wall? And there's a big literature on that. Uh, first of all, uh, if you don't have any soft mass, and if you have a um, domain wall connecting two vacua, of course you have a three-dimensional Goldustino, right, on the domain wall, just because the domain wall breaks half of the supersymmetry. Uh, adding soft terms cannot remove that, uh, because, I mean, this guy is protected by time reversal symmetry, so it's very hard to remove that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there is a nice paper by Acharya and Varfa and later authors say, uh, studying uh, whatever domain wall connecting uh, N vacua of SUN, right? In this particular case, you just have two vacua and there's a domain wall connecting it. So it is known that in the very low energy limit, you have U1 level two churn sandwich theory. So two comes from SU2, and this one comes from the, I mean, difference in the vacua. So this is what you have. So from the Tohoft anomaly matching, we know that the three, I mean, the total time reversal anomaly of the whole system is three, right? And uh, I already told you that if you have just a gold stino, I mean, it's just a major and a fermion in 3D, then nu is one. It is, in fact, a bit tricky to determine this is whether plus one or minus one because it depends on the various conventions and orientations, but you can work hard um, going over the signs very carefully and it, it turns out to be one. Then, from this equation, you conclude that this trans Hammond's theory has nu equals two. This is very interesting to me because you uh, want trans Hammond's theory is a theory w without any massless excitations, right? 
For uh, continuous symmetry, if it has an anomaly, there is necessarily uh, massless divisor freedom, right? But here, for these discrete symmetries, you can have anomalies even without any massless, massless things. So that's one thing. Okay, um, and suppose we are given a time reversal symmetric two plus one dimensional TQFT, right? So U1 Chan Simons theory is one. How do we determine its anomaly? So uh, corresponding, I mean, similar question in four dimensions is that suppose we are given a set of fermion, chiral fermions is charge Q1, Q2, Q3, da, 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 right? What's the anomaly? In that case, the formula is that you take the cube of the charges and sum, sum over them, right? So that's a very simple formula. So what is the formula in this case? So, I mean, time, I mean, three-dimensional TQFT is given by something called Moore-Zyberg data, right? So suppose we are given a Moore-Zyberg data. How do you compute, and uh, suppose it is time reversal symmetric. How do you compute its anomaly? Well, there should be a way. And this is an ongoing work with Kazuya to appear soonish. And uh, I think we cracked, uh, open that door, I mean, to understand it, but uh, we haven't completely uh, uh, nailed it. So there's a <laughs> bit of a problem, but let me explain it. So in the case of time reversal symmetry or any other anomaly, it is important to consider a non-trivial background gauge field. In the case of time reversal anomaly, the simplest non-trivial background you can think of is the cross gap, right? That's two-dimensional, but you can make it three-dimensional by multiplying by time. So you know, you, so the cross cap geometry is just a big plane, but you identify by a combination of the shift along the vertical direction and the flip of the uh, horizontal direction. So this is a cross cap uh, presented in one way. Some of you might prefer the presentation this way, right? In this case, um, you, you see that there is an isometry rotating. Therefore, there is an associated conserved quantity, right? This is the momentum P. In any non-anomalous theory, this momentum P is a quantity quantized integrally. So the momentum, or KK momentum, is labeled by a number N. This is because two pi rotation shouldn't do anything, right? So exponential of the con that conserved num quantity P for angle two pi should be one. So P should be integers. However, in an anomalous theory, this might not hold because of the phase ambiguity. So this phase ambiguity should be linear in new, right? Because the momentum is an additive quantity if you add or multiply two different quantum field theories. And nu is also an additive quantity. So we should have exponential 2 pi i p should e equals exponential 2 pi i c nu, where c is some number. Or in some other words, uh, momentum p in a cross cap background is given by some integer shifted by a certain amount proportional to this number nu. So the problem, the first problem is to determine the coefficient c. Of course, you can fix C easily by considering a system whose new is known. What is the most typical system whose new is known? As, I, as I've been to telling you, um, that is the free fermion, right? So you just consider a 3D Majorana fermion, single uh, Majorana fermion for which new is one, and you just do an explicit computation. Um, this was basically done by these three authors, Xi, Cho, and Ryu, Ryu. In the case of not the cross cap, but on the Klein bottle, but you can just divide the momentum by two, and you get the, you conclude that the fact that C is 116. So that is the simplest possibility you can think of, because it's, nu is classified by Z16, right? So the final formula is that P equals N plus nu over 16, where n is an integer. So let me uh, emphasize. The time reversal anomaly of the two plus one dimensional system manifests itself as the anomalous momentum on the cross cap geometry. Well, so we thought, we f I mean, Kazian and I thought, well, in fact, Kazia found this 
and we are very excited. We thought we had a great way to understand it. But later I found that, again, Sensei Liu and his collaborators had already noticed that, so that was nice to know, uh, in one dimension lower, but they didn't consider um, one dimension a higher case. But this is basically uh, already given in this nice paper by Cho, Shi, Mori, Mota, and Liu. Anyway, so the question was, question was how can we compute the anomalous momentum uh, for a 2D, uh, 3D TQFT? So given a cross-cap geometry, you need to compute this anomalous momentum. How do you do that? Um, well, if you are familiar with this uh, TQFT business, it's clear that this momentum can be cons obtained as the T eigenvalue under the SL2Z of this state created by this cross-cap. So this picture is a very bad <laughs> picture, but uh, you have a solid torus but with an embedded cross-cap. So this, what this T transmission does is to twist uh, th this direction by a Dan twist, and that gives you exactly the momentum, and that gives you this. So what you need to do is to, for, for this particular case of U1 level two, and U1 level minus one is necessary to kill the framing anomaly, so I'm, I just added it. So you need to determine the cross cap state in this case. But in this case, this is in fact very easy. You don't have to do anything. First of all, you need to realize that around this horizontal direction, the spin structure is automatically in the R sector, basically because you need to go around the cross cap twice, and if you go around twice in, in any spin structure, you get um, periodic spin structure. So it is as simple as that. So whatever the state is, it is a state on the T2, right? In any, R, in any uh, 3D TQFT, state on the T2 is generated by line operators inserted in the solid torus. It is a bit funny in that you need to consider line operators in the R sector, but you can easily consider that. And in fact, in this particular theory, there are just two line operators, so it's a very simple system. On the side of the U1 level two, there is one line operator which is completely trivial, it is identity with spin zero, and a non-trivial one with spin plus one quarter. Uh, on the U1, Minus one side, I'm considering the R, line, R sector. Therefore, again, there's only one line operator whose uh, spin is minus one over eight. So you need to combine this and that to get, get a line operator with uh, dimension minus one over eight, or combine this and that to give, get a line operator with uh, dimension plus one over eight. Therefore, T is, T eigenvalue is either one over eight or one over minus one over eight. This translates to two over 16 or minus two over 16. So from the argument I gave you before, nu is either plus two or minus two. So that's what you wanted to have, right? Uh, Some time, uh, ten, 10 minutes ago, I guess, we started from this uh, domain wall construction, uh, which is guaranteed to have nu equals three, which corresponds to nu equals one gold steno plus this Chan Simon system. So this should have had nu equals three. So it is consistent. Uh, for more complicated uh, TQFTs, the determination of this cross cap state is not this simple, but uh, there are many consistency conditions need to be satisfied by the cross cap state, and this can be done in many cases. So more details can be found in the upcoming paper. So that, this is basically my talk. Um, so let me summarize in, uh, as just by saying the future direction. We know that oriented 2D as 3D TQFT is specified by the data satisfying the moore zyberg axioms, right? So in order to really understand an orientable, I mean, time reversal anomaly in the presence of spin structure, we just need to have an oriented spin version of the moore zyberg axiom. It's surprising that even the oriented spin version of the moore zyberg axiom doesn't seem to be uh, worked out. Maybe it's just that I don't know, but it doesn't seem to be worked out. But once this axiom <laughs> is correctly written down, then, for example, this Z16 classification of the time reversal anomaly will be an automatic outcome, and I would hope to work this out in the future. 
So this was the end of my talk, and uh, happy 60th birthday, Natty. Thank you very much. We have some t time for some questions. I didn't understand the one eighth in U1 level minus one, or minus one eighth in your career. Ah. W what does it mean that you're in the Ramon sector and you have minus one eighth? Um, so one way to think about this is to consider a U1 level four theory, right? So if you have a spin TQFT, you always have a non-spin TQFT obtained by summing over the spin structure. So U1 level four theory has four line operators, right? Uh, so you can call it one, a, a squared, A cubed. And A squared corresponds to the transparent fermion operator. And in order to get back to the spin TQFT, you need to gauge by this A squared. So usually you just keep every line operator which uh, trivially braids with this tr transparent line operator, fermion operator, but that automatically means that uh, the operators you keep is uh, in the NS sector because what this phase really means just the spin structure around the line operator. If you instead consider, I mean, this line operator A in A1, A, A squared, A cubed, A has the right braiding so that around this line operator you have uh, minus one, so it is in the R sector. And using this U1 to the fourth, uh, sorry, U1 level four theory, it's easy to compute the dimension of the that line operator. You cannot do that, no. right? Because uh, then, uh, I mean, we need to understand the spin TQFT, right? So, we, uh, so I just mentioned U1 level four theory just as a mean to compute the uh, dimension of the R sector line operator. In the spin TQFT, in, in three dimensions, I believe that there is a nice uh, correspondence with 2D spin RCFT, right? Just in the case of non-spin case. The, in the case of 2D spin uh, RCFT, there are NS vertex operators and there are also R sector line, uh, R, sorry, R vertex operators. So if you just consider the, uh, um, insertions or conformal blocks involving just NS line operators, sorry, NS vertex operators, the story don't, doesn't close. You need to all, all, always consider both NS uh, insertions and R insertions. So I'm just saying that uh, in this case, you need to consider this R, R sector line operator. So that's, that's something, uh, very confusing to me, yeah. But this is forced because once you, because you want to consider this cross cap state and having a cross cap inside automatically forces us to have the R sector here. Well, if you don't want to use the R sector line, um, you can just use any sector on the other side and the, determine the state there and use the S, I mean, S operation to the, find the eigenvalues of the T in this channel, and they are given by this number. So if you don't like our sector line operator, then you can do away with that too, if you combine the standard NS line operator and the, and the S operation. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe one more question. Can you ask the same question for uh, three-dimensional conform field theories? What is the parity anomaly? Um, y yes. Uh, so that, that's a very good <laughs> uh, question. So this fact should be very universal. I mean, it's just a fact about the four-dimensional bulk. So the four-dimensional bulk is characterized by a quantity nu, which is a mod 16 quantity. So whenever you have a time reversal invariant system, then its anomaly is a mod 16 integer. So that, so that can be massless measurable of fermions, or that can be a completely gapped topological phase like TQFT. But yeah, CFT is an interesting example, but 
I don't know how to compute the anomaly. But again, this argument that the anomaly is contained in this anomalous part of the momentum is a universal fact. I didn't use, uh, I didn't use the fact that this is a TQFT or it is a CFT to show this. This is a very general fact. So if you can formulate your um, CFT on this background, and if you can compute the anomalous momentum, then yes, you can compute the anomaly, but I don't know how to do that, except in the case of free fermions, which is a CFT. Yeah. Okay, I think it's time to move on. Let's uh, thank Yuji again. Thank you very much. <laughs>